everyone here, if you guys know, After Effects or anything, if you edit video, you live in a timeline, right? It's like everything that you do is centered around the timeline and everything is flat, right? Um, so I just wanted to introduce the series. It's called Shelf Life. We've been uh, running about a year now with the museum on this piece and it's a traditional 2D, 2D video series. Um, it's in its second season and we just kicked off yesterday doing the entire piece in VR. Um, so you guys can look up the Museum of Natural History right now and you can see it on your phone. It works on your phone. It works on uh, VR headsets, does anything like that. We used a combination of After Effects and Premiere and Cinema 4D and Metal's plugins to create skyboxes and all sorts of cool stuff, which I'm going to get into. Um, so the, the first episode is fossil hunting in the Gobi, right? Um, how do you transport yourself into another world that's already been shot from like a hundred years ago using footage from like a hundred years ago. How do you do that? You know, because you can't just go back in time with a VR camera like one of these, right? And go shoot these guys in this civil war like uh, in Mongolia when they're hunting for fossils or World War II or whatever, right? How do you do that? So I can't, came up with this idea of working in After Effects and using traditional 2D assets, which you can see the first test that I ever did, this is over a year ago, it's like a complete failure, you know, it's like you're, it's like the, it's, it's not, you can't trick anyone into thinking that that's, that's cool because typically in After Effects you have, you're kind of working in smoke and mirrors, you know, it's like, I can hide this layer over here and underneath something else, and it's kind of cool. I can do something like that, you know. But in After Effects in 360, you can't do that. It's like impossible. Um, so this is sort of a visualization of how that you can't really do that, you know. Like this, you can tell like this is 2D, you know. So then you're you're stuck with this problem of saying, am I going to render it in 3D? Am I going to learn, you know, some advanced 3D software and like. You know, and now I'm gonna have to upgrade my whole studio and all this stuff, right? So I started experimenting with photography and using traditional 2D assets, and that's my little girl right there. So she's like, "What is going on in my 360 environment?" So the problem with shooting with a theta or a traditional camera with historical stories is that these ferns didn't exist a hundred like a million years ago right so that was one of the pushbacks that i got it was like these this species of fauna is non-existent back then right so that's a complete that's another failure as far as like trying to get this to work right so of uh, so eventually what we added what i figured out was in after effects if you you can take your 2D source files, which just came from a researcher in the, at the science team, um, convert it to an echo rectangular format, which is basically like if you took this echo rectangular JPEG, you wrapped it in a sphere, you have a skybox, and you can look around and see all around you and basically explore it. And that's just like scientifically accurate, right? Um, so you basically take your original 2D source file convert it to an echo rectangular file. You combine other textures and sort of start creating this 360 world, right? And this is all like in After Effects. You're not using any kind of proprietary like 3D, you don't need any like upgraded PC software or anything, right? Um, so you start adding in elements, you know, 3D elements like a frog and like some archival material, you start layering stuff in like you do in After Effects, traditional After Effects, right? Um, so after that, you convert it to a cube map, which is basically an easy way to sort of look at things in two dimensions. This is your front, left, right, back, top, down view. And start experimenting with speeds and like ways of editing, transitions, that type of thing. And you end with your final file. Um, so that was, that was a big experiment on our end to see if it could actually work, and it did. From there, we said, okay, we're gonna actually make the real piece. Let's see if we can do this for real, right? So this piece involved hundreds and hundreds of scans, 
of old archival material because you can't go back in time, like I said. Um, here's some samples of some pieces that we scanned from the, uh, the museum library. So you can see where I'm coming from. You, you, we really lucked out on these, uh, these panoramas because after I saw this, I was like, this could be, you could wrap this in a spherical space and it could possibly work and start matte painting this stuff on. Um, so cut out a lot of stuff. Um, the new iPad is really great for cutting out like images like this. Um, scanning in maps to layer on top of the 360 space as well. So using the previous concept, started layering stuff in, starting with textures, determining a horizon line in 360, adding those panorama photos I showed you earlier, color correcting, adding the tent space, adding this little guy here and, you know, video clips and layering graphics. So that sort of like gives you a broad overview of like how the piece was made. Um, so that's one of, that's a still from the final file, um, which you can actually watch the entire thing at the, uh, the Museum of Natural History's Facebook page or YouTube channel or whatever. Um, it just was released yesterday. So we also had the sort of, I had this predicament of being a filmmaker was, you know, how, how do we film the president, um, the, the guy that's in head of, head of paleontology, how do we go to him and start shooting him, right? And, and because we had an interview shoot as well. So did a lot of research. GoPros are completely, un, completely insane as far as uh, a budget goes, something on a budget. And you have sink exposure settings, overheating issues, that type of thing. So in the end, I, we went with a Samsung Gear 360, which is great lightweight setup, and it just worked. Um, with a wireless lav. Um, so we set it up as an 8K photo, um, as a, your sort of template, right? Uh, shot the 4K video, as you can see, in the same angle. Cleaned up the photo, which you converted to a cube map, and you remove the tripod, as you can see. Um, and this is the final backplate 8K still, right? Which you can tell it's, you know, we, I added some vignetting up here and denoised it. So that's before and that's after. Um, so you have a really clean 8K backplate. And then in After Effects, what you do is you mask the area which your video was shot in and then pop in the video because you basically have really high resolution here. If I'd been using the video in that backplate, it would not have been as detailed. So that's our template that we used. After that, we overlay motion graphics and lower thirds and then identify the, uh, the specimens in the room. Um, even further, um, we have a template that we use to sort of shift everything over and make sure that everything is within this field of view, which is, of course, YouTube's limited field of view. Um, and you can, you can watch it at uh, amnh.org slash shelf life. Another cool thing is that we had a regular 2D episode that works with the VR episode. We also made um, three ways to watch a 360 video, which I think a lot of, this was the first 360 video that we published, so it was a really good idea to do that because a lot of people had no idea how to watch it. Um, and some of the lessons that we learned were you know, Facebook always has the most number of views no matter what. And it's because Facebook now supports this 360 video with your phone and it just works. You get immediate feedback from the comments, of course. Um, it sells your client on the potential of immersive content instead of it, you needing an advanced headset or anything like that. Um, and it just works. Um, another thing to keep in mind is when you are editing, thinking of vertical phones versus horizontal phones and what they're going to see as well. Um, so another key takeaway is like, don't rush the pacing of whatever you're doing. Um, I think a lot of people think in terms of web video, which you need to keep sh cutting, cutting, cutting. Um, in VR and 360, it's not the same way because people do want to sort of explore and take their time and to look around. Um, and you want to ease the viewer into the scene too and not just like, 
start off with this crazy collage of motion and graphics and music and stuff. Another thing is, um, you know, it takes the best resolution for YouTube is 4K to load this stuff. So it's always good to have a three to eight second simple graphics in the beginning to sort of let things load in. Um, environment scale is key. For instance, if somebody was giant in front of me, you want to make sure everything is positionally correct. Um, and guiding the viewer through graphics and motion graphics and guiding their eye through sound design and stuff like that. Um, so, you know, I think it's really realistic for anyone that already understands After Effects to jump into this VR 360 editing style. I think it's like super easy. I think it's easier than a lot of people actually think it is. Um, and I also think just using the, your current workflow can work within this medium. Um, I think a lot of people are focusing on the tech, the new tech and the hardware that's coming out. Nothing's really there yet. Um, you know, this little baby toddler trying to stand up on its own. It's not really happening. Everyone's kind of falling in their face right now. Um, but I think it's just, the point of this is just to focus on the stories you've already been making as video creators. And if we just keep making great stories in this medium and the way that we always do work, just expanding it, the canvas to surround you, I think that's what's really going to make this a big thing and push people into doing more of this stuff. Um, so that's it. Thanks.